All right, so recording has started. Today is Friday. We are in week, I think it's week eight. Um, I'm beginning to get confused on what weeks we're in. Uh, we are in the respiratory system. You are going to have two labs due Sunday, and then remember next week we're still the respiratory system, and we're going to have pulmonary fu pulmonary function testing, so PFTs, and we're going to talk about that in lab, and you're going to have a PFT lab and a quiz for week nine, and then it's week 10 that you're going to take your test. So it's coming along, um, and we're still in the early parts of your respiratory chapter so hopefully you've maybe read the chapter you've maybe watched the lecture by the anatomy GMC lady who follows again the um, the chapter according to how our authors wrote the book and therefore you have a little bit of background material to come over here and now here listen to the way I approach it which is heavily heavily influenced by my experience and my background and again it's just a different way to try to cover the same objectives and hopefully gives me a platform to share my stories share my experiences to make it a little more interesting for you to listen to rather than just hearing dry bullets statements get read off a slide okay so I am very big on understanding the four gas laws all right and it might be that you never really think about them again um, but I like to bring them up because it is a little bit of physics in this class and for many of us we never have to take a physics class but then it might help you one day on Jeopardy when you get to be on there and you know your gas laws. Second thing is some of these gas laws we can apply to multiple organ systems and we have already and it's just another way to uh, show how those laws of nature, those laws of physics apply in multiple places and, um, and they make great essay questions, foot stomp, uh, for you to demonstrate to me that you can take something simple as like a small little equation or a small little concept and yet apply it and use really good exam from our respiratory system to be able to demonstrate how these things apply, okay? So, Boyle's Law is sometimes, again, in our Air Force world, was joked as the balloon in the air law. So, when you have a balloon and you release it and balloons go up in the atmosphere, as the pressure of the atmosphere gets less and less. So, again, think of my stack of mattresses. As the balloon goes up higher and higher, the amount of mattresses stacked on top, the amount of total pressure as you go up in altitude is decreasing. And so what happens is the molecules in the balloon can start to push and make the balloon actually increase in size. All right. And so Boyle's Law is basically that the volume and the pressure are inversely related. Okay. And so if I have, again, a chamber and the pressure on the outside of the chamber decreases as I go up in altitude, the molecules in that chamber are going to start to push on the walls and try to expand out to a bigger volume so the pressures stay equal inside and outside. All right. And in the case of our middle ear, as that happens, you'll sometimes hear a clicking sound or you'll feel that there's an equalization happening that the in middle ear is going to equalize as you go up in altitude and where there's more pressure in the middle ear, ear area, it'll try to flow through little tiny uh, imperfections in your eustachian tube and equalize, okay? Now, when we come down in altitude, all right, if you've ever seen a balloon that's gone up and, you know, I don't know that y'all used to do this, but like put like notes on balloons and have like a big pen pal thing or like there was charities where everybody would put something like a name and you'd like sponsor a balloon and you'd like release it and it was like a big event and then some of the balloons would end up landing maybe a few hours later and if you looked at the rubber of the balloon they were like kind of wrinkly and part of that wrinkling came from as the balloon filled with helium went up in altitude and expanded that rubber expanded out and then eventually as the helium started to kind of leak out and the balloon came back down and it compressed the the imperfections of the rubber getting stretched form stretch marks and wrinkles and the balloon would come back down that's Boyle's law all right so Boyle's law is sometimes known as the balloon law okay now in relationship to our lungs 
all right? We are going to think about ventilation and Boyle's Law together, all right? So your lungs are like a balloon, okay? And because of the pleural cavities, all right, tied to the chest wall and then again pulling the lungs in those elastic, reforce, uh, elastic forces and kind of keeping it inflated, all right, when we are going to want to inhale and bring air into our lungs, we need to create a pressure gradient. All right, and we need a pressure gradient of here is atmosphere at 760 millimeters of pressure, and the air pressure in our lungs, we need it to come down. We need it to go down to 758, 756, 755. Well, we need to make the pressure of the lungs, the air pressure, go down a little bit, and the way to do that is by Boyle's Law. So what we're going to do is we're going to contract the diaphragm, we're going to contract the intercostals, and those muscles are going to pull the rib cage out, pull the sternum further away, pull the muscle in the lungs down into the abdominal cavity, and it's going to make, with the pleural cavities help and those visceral and parietal pleural membranes, it's going to make the lung tissue and all the air sacs of the alveoli, it's going to make them all expand into a bigger cavity, a bigger organ, a bigger air sac, all right? And because Boyle's Law is that anytime the volume, the chamber gets bigger, the molecules in that chamber, the air or the fluid, whatever it is, they are going to be able to spread out. And as they spread out, as they're randomly bumping into each other, that's going to happen at a decreased rate. Because remember, particles, molecules, they're in constant motion. And so if you make them have more space, a bigger chamber, they're going to hit each other at less frequent, less incidence. And that means that the pressure inside registered by the particle movements is going to decrease okay and once that decrease happens I now have a situation where the pressure of the air in those air sacs inside the lungs has decreased from 760 to 756 755 754 it all depends on how big the volume I created with inhaling contractions was able to pull the ribs was able to pull down on the diaphragm and create a bigger lung and air alveoli airspace all right and so now that i've created that pressure gradient the atmospheric pressure is greater at 760 than the alveoli or intrapulmonary pressure inside my lungs and I have this now flow equation of air is going to flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure and fill in this cavity that is the lungs until the pressure inside equals the pressure outside okay all right now when I go to relax the muscles of the diaphragm, relax the intercostal muscles, the elastic recoil forces of elastin connective tissue, surfactant, or not surfactant, surfactant's breaking up, but the water surface tension that's created because I'm humidifying and basically making the air in my lungs very, very damp, those conditions plus the elastic recoil of tighten and the elastic tissues of the muscles, the ribs having again being pulled out, the cartilage having been pulled out, the elastic qualities of the rib cage, all of those elastic forces and surface tension are going to make the lungs kind of come back into their resting position. So the diaphragm is going to come back up, the, the chest wall is going to come back and collapse down. And now my cavity of my lungs has gotten smaller but I had more molecules brought in a few seconds ago when I made it bigger so now all those molecules are condensed into a smaller space and now they're hitting each other at a higher rate which represents that the pressure inside the lungs now that it's gotten smaller and there's more molecules in there has now increased and it's now greater than 760 maybe it's 764 maybe it's 765 but now again per the flow equation I have an area of high pressure inside versus an area of low pressure which is still 760 out here and now air wants to flow out all right so ventilation is all about manipulating the lung volume 
So if I create a little bit bigger volume, a little bit bigger cavity, the molecules spread out and their pressure drops and I bring more molecules in from the outside and I inhale. And then I let things recoil back to resting and the molecules that I brought in are now crowded with the molecules already in there and it's a smaller cavity and so now the pressure is greater than the atmosphere, greater than 760 and I have to somehow let some of it out. Okay, now being able to create those lung volume changes is very, very, very dependent on that pleural cavity, that pleural space, and that I have a mobile chest wall, a mobile chest cavity. So if I was to put a corset on, and they used to do this back in the day, thank God we don't wear corsets, or if I was to put like a... Um, a bulletproof vest or something that really, really, really restricted my chest from being able to move, let's do the math. Well, if I can't bring my lungs out as much, the, the ability of the lung cavity to expand out is not going to be as great. I might not be able to get as great a pressure gradient, I might not be able to get as much movement of air into my body on a breath. And so what I might find is I am not respirating, not breathing enough air, and I might find I have to start taking more shallow but more breaths in order to get enough oxygen into my system. Okay, and so it was back in the day, again, people would wear corsets and they would complain about they can't breathe because the corset would be tied so tight that it wouldn't let any mobility of their chest happen. Okay, pregnancy. When you're pregnant, again, the baby as it grows, it, it keeps taking up real estate and your diaphragm can't pull down and can't push into the abdominal cavity because now you have this big sack and baby stuck in there, the little parasite. And so that can be very uh, restricting to your ability to, again, increase by Boyle's Law your chest and your lung capacity, your volume. And so again, sometimes in late pregnancy, you see women have a lot more shallow breathing and higher respiratory rate because they're impeded in their ability to take deep breaths because the little parasite, the little aliens down there blocking their ability for their lungs to come and expand. With age, it's natural that our elastic qualities of the lungs, our elastic qualities of the bones, our elastic qualities of the uh, muscles, of the connective tissue in all of the regions in and around the lungs and the chest wall are going to decrease. And so with age, we see that sometimes people can't take big deep breaths because again, they just don't have those elastic qualities anymore. And so they're having then, if they want to get more oxygen into their system, they have to rely on getting more number of breaths going because they can't take deep big breaths and really make their chest come out and get their lungs to really expand to get a big flow of air in and out. All right. Now, Normally, we don't worry about making the lungs compress smaller beyond just the natural recoil, but if we needed to try to blow more air out, that's where, again, our abdominal muscles, and if you've ever tried to exhale, usually you'll curl up just naturally and, like, try to pull yourself in towards your knees, and you'll hunch over. Anything to, again, really push and compress the lungs beyond the normal recoil would help you potentially make the lungs even smaller and help again push even more air out of your lungs. All right, but again, the pleural cavities kind of work to where the natural inhale is just a little slight movement out because the lungs, I'm sorry, the ribs, the muscles, the cartilage, and everything have a little bit of movement to be able to move out a bit, and it just moves back to its resting feature. But there is a little play if we needed to to go even further in, further collapsing, further pushing in on the lungs. Uh, we just don't normally do that. Uh, unless we're exercising or, again, really trying to do a maximal exhalation, all right? And then we'll recruit abdominal muscles and some other accessory chest and belly muscles to help push even further in our rib cage, our ribs, and our um, diaphragm, okay? Okay, so 
um, compliance. So this is that term that I'm kind of alluding to of your chest has an ability to kind of move out and kind of move in. And with the chest having the ability to move out and in, it has some give, it has some give and go, you have the ability to manipulate your lung volume to be a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. All right. And again, compliance is going to be based on that I have connective tissue and connective tissue has elastin and connective tissue is correctly made and functional in its ability to get stretched and to recoil back, all right? And so again, with time, with uh, certain diseases, certain uh, triggers of toxic chemicals and materials, I can kill off my fibroblast in and around my lungs, in and around my connective tissue of my muscles, my connective tissue in my uh, cartilage, my and around my periosteum. And as all of that connective tissue is damaged and there's less elastin and in bone there's less collagen, the ability of my chest to move a little out, move a little in decreases. And so the ability of my chest to pull my lungs out a little bit, pull my lungs in a little bit is decreased as well as just the lungs themselves having that ability to be pulled out without tearing and be pulled in is decreased. So think of it as like a rubber band, all right? You know, rubber bands have a little bit, you can give and you can kind of pull. I think I have a hair tie in my pocket. Okay, so again, just naturally, there's a little bit of give and that's the natural connective tissue. Well, with time and with overuse, this is going to get more brittle, this is going to get more um, snagged and torn and the odds of it being as give and go as compliant are going to decrease and it, it runs the risk that at some point in time it might snap okay and your body is the same way most of your life you're a healthy little rubber band but under certain conditions other certain circumstances given enough time you're going to be less rubbery and less give and go and less elastic Okay, so that's part of compliance, the connective tissue integrity of the features of the chest wall and as well as the lung tissue itself. The other part of compliance is back to water and chemistry and physics, all right? Water, when you put a bunch of water molecules together, it wants to orient the molecules to bead and to kind of suction in and pull. That's known as surface tension, all right? And in our alveolar air sacs, in our little balloons, that humid air wants to make our alveoli air sacs become smaller little bubbles, smaller little balloons. And that is not a great thing because then to be able to push air into those small balloons, it was gonna, it's gonna take more force, it's gonna take more pressure gradient. And we don't necessarily have that ability very easily with given that we're limited with how much chest mobility and elastic properties we have of the lungs and the chest wall. So to kind of prevent all of our alveoli from becoming small little tiny raisins, uh, and to keep them kind of inflated and looking like grapes, uh, we want to break that surface tension. And surfactant is a soapy secretion that some of our pneumocyte cells create. And again, we talked about this in lab. The importance of making surfactant comes around the gestational week 24, 25, 26. It's not set exactly, but it's a big critical kind of survivability point of a fetus and for a newbie, it's a big uh, issue that until the newborn pre, um, preterm baby can make its own surfactant, it might have to be given surfactant to help break up the surface tissue so its alveoli look like grapes and not like raisins and are completely collapsed in and then really, really difficult, really, really almost impossible to reinflate without e external exogenous help, okay? So having compliant lungs, having compliant chest walls, having surfactant production is part of how you keep Boyle's Law and the ability to ventilate, the ability to inhale and exhale, air in and out, works. All right? And with age, compliance is naturally going to decrease, and we just hope it doesn't decrease so much that we're not able to continue to breathe on our own. Okay? Um, all right.
So some of these pressures that I've talked about, again, for Boyle's Law, there's a volume component and a pressure component. All right, some of the important pressures we're always talking about is what is the atmospheric air, and that pressure is usually atmospheric pressure, and if you want to measure it in millimeters of mercury, again, we use millimeters because we tried to stick with the uh, metric system, it should be 760 millimeters of mercury. Again, that represents if I push on a bowl of mercury, I'm going to displace some of it, force it up a tube, it's going to rise to a height of 760 millimeters. If I did that in the English, and again, go look at your weather app. Today, let me see, today in my weather app, uh, sometimes you can find information on daily. What is, uh, I'm not able to find it really quickly. Okay, here it is. Uh, pressure. Today's pressure is 30.31 inches of mercury. So that means if I am weighing the atmosphere that's pushing on my shoulders, pushing on my head, and I put some mercury up there, it would push the mercury to a height of 30. 0.31 inches. All right, and so it's a little, we're under a little bit of a higher than normal atmospheric pressure right now. Okay, um, and so they say it's going to rain in a few days. Well, that's because they say a low pressure system is coming in, and low pressure means uh, the pressure is going to maybe be in a few days instead of 30.31, it might be 29.9, 29.9. Eight. Okay, so it's not talking huge pressure changes unless we go. What's the pressure in Denver? Um, Denver is about a mile above sea level, seven thousand feet high. Um, so it, we would expect its pressure to maybe be more normally, maybe around. And I'm just throwing this out. Twenty-eight inches or twenty-seven inches. Okay, so the mercury displacement is less because there are less mattresses, there's less force being pushed on the mercury 7,000 feet above sea level, okay? Um, all right, so that's the pressure, and that's going to stay pretty much stable as I sit here and breathe. So the pressure that I'm going to work to create a gradient with for atmospheric pressure is my intrapulmonary, sometimes it's also known as your intraalveolar pressure. Okay, and that's the pressure in each alveoli sac, each little grape, and then collectively across all of those grapes and all of those terminal bronchioles and airways. Okay, and that's the pressure that as I, again, pull my chest open and with the pleural and uh, cavity, pull the lungs to a bigger volume, that's the air sacs and the pressure that's going to drop two, three, four, five, six, depending on how mobile I am, um, millimeters in pressure, that is then going to be, okay, I'm now at 756, atmosphere's at 760, there's a four millimeter pressure gradient, so air flows in, all right? And then it's intra pulmonary intraalveolar pressure that when the recoil and the relaxation of my diaphragm happens and the lungs get smaller that the molecules in there hit each other at a higher rate and the pressure in there goes up to 763, 764, 765. It now is higher than the atmosphere and I have an open tube, an open container, so then air flows out. Now when you are not seeing air movement. So if you ever do yoga classes, they'll sometimes be like, okay, let's feel your inhale, feel the pause, then let's exhale, let's feel the pause. Those pauses are the points in time where the atmospheric pressure and your intrapulmonary, intraalveolar pressure are equal. And if they're equal, then no movement of air should be occurring. All right. Now remember, the intrapleural pressure is between the mesothelium of the parietal pleural membrane and the mesothelium of the visceral pleural membrane. That little bit of space where serous fluid is getting put in by both the mesothelial layers. And because of the surface tension and because of the fluid in there, all right, remember that that is going to be a sealed cavity with water and surface tension that's going to then be just slightly less pressure than the atmosphere and the lungs, the intraalveolar pressure, all right? 
And so we refer to it as a little bit of a negative pressure when in truth it's not negative, it's just a pressure that gen generally tends to be two to three millimeters of pressure less than the atmosphere and two to three millimeters of pressure less than your intrapulmonary pressure. And so when we just refer to it then as the intrapleural pressure, sometimes we just refer to it as that number that's the difference, right? So over here in this chart, when they show you what is intrapleural pressure, they show you that intrapleural pressure is usually about negative three millimeters of mercury below atmosphere. So that means if you really want to put a number on it, if atmosphere is 760, then intrapleural pressure is probably public math, so excuse me if I have to think about it, 756, 757, sorry, 757, because 7 plus 3 is 10, okay, all right, and then as we inhale, and my chest gets bigger, all right, the parietal membrane's pulling further away from, again, the visceral membrane, even though both are moving and the lungs are moving, there is a little bit of a widening, and a widening of the pleural pressure per Boyle's law means the pressure in there gets even less, all right, because it decreases even more. So that's part of the reason why as you're inhaling, look at my pull, pull, intrapleural pressure is doing. It's actually also getting more negative, meaning the negative value 757 is becoming 756, 755, all right, 754. And part of that is because as the chest gets bigger and the lungs pull out and the muscles pull out and the muscles pull down and the lungs are going with it, but the parietal membrane is going with it a little more than the visceral membrane, and so my pleural space is getting just a wee bit bigger, okay? And then when I relax those muscles and everything collapses back down, all right, my parietal membrane gets back closer to my visceral membrane, and you can see that the difference between the intrapleural membrane and the atmosphere gets less negative because it gets back up towards that 757, 756, all right? So again, they're showing you just the difference. They're showing you instead of putting 756, 754, 750, you know, blah, they're just saying we start at the intrapleural pressure is three less than the atmosphere. It becomes four less. It becomes five less. It becomes six less. And then as we exhale, it becomes five less, four less, then back to three less. And because they do that with a negative number, again, simple people like to say, oh, it's a negative pressure. It really isn't. It's just a pressure that's a little less than the atmosphere and at times the intrapleural pressure, I mean the intrapulmonary pressure, okay? Now, we'll talk about this in the pulmonary function test. The air that you're gonna move when you inhale, when you ventilate across your mouth, that is known as your tidal volume. And on average, people move about 500 milliliters of air. So again, a soda can is 355 milliliters of fluid. So you're in a given breath, you're probably breathing a little bit more than a soda can. If I had a small small water bottle, I think 12 ounces, no, about maybe 14 or 16 ounce water bottle is about 500 milliliters. So that's about what we usually breathe across the mouth. Now, remember, not all of that air is going to make it all the way to every single grape, every single alveoli. So we're going to have, again, breaths per tidal volume, a respiratory minute ventilation, how much air is moving across your lips, getting from the outside inside your mouth and your nose. And then we're going to have conduction zone air that that air is mixing with, and some of it is going to make it all the way into the lungs, and some of it will not. And so the amount of fresh air that actually gets into the alveoli, into the lungs, that's going to be your alveolar minute volume. And it's going to represent probably a slightly less than 500 milliliters, somewhere around 300, 350 is what is actually of the air you breathe across your mouth actually getting into the lungs. Okay? And it mixes with the air already in your lungs. And so that air that's already in your lungs, we'll learn, is our residual or our dead airspace volume. Okay? So for making Boyle's Law happen, 
that is up to the muscles of inspiration and your respiratory muscles that are muscles of inspiration the main one is your diaphragm and remember your diaphragm is kind of a funky thing because it's a skeletal muscle under the phrenic nerves and you do have some okay let me make my diaphragm contract some some voluntary control over it but when we go to sleep, we're not voluntarily thinking about breathing, so there is some involuntary controls to it as well. All right, so it's kind of a skeletal muscle and under some voluntary control, but it's also, when we're not thinking about it, can be under involuntary control. All right, the other set of muscles that are helping to, again, open the ribs and pull the ribs further apart and further out are going to be the external intercostal muscles and if you go back and look at the external and the internal intercostals the difference is their orientation and arrangement on the uh, ribs between the ribs so these are the muscles that when they contract they help pull the ribs apart and pull the ribs out and away okay now you can also again my clavicle my scapula I can try to open my clavicle open my shoulders again everybody's done like chest expansion you pull your shoulders up back and down so those are the accessory muscles that if I really want to try to take a bigger inhale I can try to use um, the internal intercostals, the sternocleidomastoid, pull my clavicle up, my serratus anterior to kind of pull my, again, um, my chest up uh, open, and then some of my scalene, again, pulling my scapulas to kind of pull back towards pinching a penny in the middle of my spine, okay? Um, so there's some, I'm sorry, there's some uh, accessories there, all right? Again, when I want to try to force myself to exhale all right then I'm going to try to use my belly muscles because if my belly pushes my small intestines large intestines stomach and liver and spleen in more the diaphragm can't come down as much and the diaphragm will have to actually be pushed upward a little bit and that'll again help make the lungs a little smaller than normal and help me again make a smaller balloon for more air to be forced out. I can also again try to use some of the pecs to pull my shoulders in and to kind of curl in anatomically speaking a lot of flexion in my spine uh, to try to again make my chest collapse inward. All right so those are some of the breathing and some of again going back to Boyle's law. Now I don't really take that much stock into do you only breathe with your diaphragm for some breaths? Do you only breathe with just your intercostals? To tell the truth, you're going to use a little bit of both. Um, if you do some forms of yoga and you really do try to focus on feeling like my diaphragm and trying to, again, feel as I inhale that I push my belly out and pull it in, um, you can start to try to breathe a little bit more with more of one muscle but it takes a lot of conscious awareness. Um, it takes some really good cueing to try to help, again, formulate in that frontal lobe, those motor pathways to make those muscles work. Um, more so, I would say we use these different types of breathing when we can't use the muscles. So when you're pregnant, and especially in the later stage, and you really can't use your diaphragm that much because there's not room for it to pull down because the baby's there, you're going to find that, yeah, your coastal breathing is more having to be the main source of breath because that's the only muscle that still has some movement and again if you put a corset on or you put a bunch of heavy kevlar uh material or some type of jacketing and vesting that won't let your chest come out then yeah you might find you have to use more diaphragmic breathing because the option of using the chest to move outward is just not there with the type of clothes or external vesting you're wearing okay uh, when we try to force our breaths when we really try to think about and again this would be when you're exercising um, or when like when you're in the uh, in our videos going back to the hypoxia when you have like pressure breathing occurring because you're on a mask we call that hy hyper uh, hyperpenia all right and uh, and again that's usually going to be uh, when we're really trying to force our inhales in and out both phases and we're trying to force again bigger inhales and bigger exhales to move eczemize as much as we can the air coming across the mouth and the air getting into the alveoli okay okay so some of the numbers of breaths we take a minute if we don't think about it our breathing rate can be anywhere from 10 breaths to 18 breaths again it's 
a little bit of need, a little bit of that compliance. So when I was pregnant, I probably erred more on taking 16 to 20 breaths a minute. Uh, when I'm doing a yoga practice and I'm really into my meditation, I might be down in the 10 to 12 breaths per minute rate. All right. Uh, when I'm not thinking about it, obviously, I don't know exactly how many breaths because I'm not thinking about it. And if somebody was to probably count them when I'm not thinking about it, I'm sure I'm probably in the range of 12 to 16 breaths. Okay. Um, and again, if you do that of your resting heart rate somewhere around 70 to 80 beats per minute, if you're breathing somewhere around 12 to 18 breaths, about every four beats of the heart, you're sending blood to the lungs and air from that breath over the next four breaths is what's oxygenating those four beats of stroke volume coming into the lungs and heading back to the left heart. Okay. Again, like with cardiac output, I don't want to measure the lung and the function of the lungs on one breath because if during that breath, you make me giggle, I get a tickle in my throat, or I have a cough, or whatever. I don't want to measure the entire function of the system on a sample of one breath. So we do things for the respiratory system just like with cardiac output over a minute. All right. And so that's why we will look at how's your respiratory system working over a minute, meaning how many breaths we're taking and how much air is moving in those breaths, and we get a respiratory rate and a respiratory volume over the minute, okay? And that's, again, according to our mouth, is our respiratory minute volume of how much me breaths and how much air is moving across my mouth over the course of a minute. So if cardiac output was heart rate times stroke volume, this is breath per minute, so the rate and the tidal volume, which is kind of like the stroke volume, uh, working over that minute. And again, not all of that air makes it all the way down to the alveoli. So even to get a better idea, and this again is gonna be more of a big issue when you're looking at lungs that have tumors, that have uh, decreased compliance, that have disease processes taking place. So it might be that parts of the lungs are not working, so air is not getting in there. You wanna know how much of the air going across the mouth is making it into the alveoli. You wanna look at the alveolar minute volume. So you wanna look at not just the tidal volume, the number of breaths is the same, but for the air getting into the alveoli, so the tidal volume minus the dead air space volume, how much is actually getting into the alveoli that are then perfused with capillary moving blood and getting oxygen into our cardiovascular system. And again, for general rules of thumb, 12 breaths and 500 milliliters of tidal volume to the math means that I move about six liters of air across my mouth every minute. And that should be sufficient as a healthy, normal human to oxygenate my five liters of blood that's in my cardiovascular system, okay? Now, if I wanna be more specific, of that six liters of air going across my mouth, how much of it is actually getting into my alveolar airspace? Again, on average, my tidal volume minus my dead airspace, and I'm gonna assume I have a pretty low amount of dead airspace, uh, I would then find that the math would work to be about 4.2 liters of air out of my six liters of air in my mouth moving is actually making it to the alveoli. And that's the air that's oxygen rich, that's bringing oxygen for my red blood cells up and for some of that oxygen to go and dissolve into my plasma as a dissolved gas, okay? So, I'm having some issues breathing. You are my nurse. You're going to come up to me and go, okay, I need to try to help you because the little thing on my finger says I'm hypoxic, meaning my oxygen levels in my blood are not at 98%. I'm down at like 89%, 9%, and I'm beginning to get loopy and crazy, and I'm looking at you with fear in my eyes. All right, so here are some of my options. One, try to get you to increase your respiratory rate. Now that's probably happening anyway, and that's why people usually have panic attacks and they're hyperventilating because they are freaked out and they're not getting oxygen in, all right? And then the next thing is to try to get me to breathe bigger. 
So if I'm wearing a corset, if I'm wearing a Kevlar vest, if I, you know, could try to get me to open up and up taller and try to get me to, again, not restrict any types of chest and lung movements to get bigger volumes, all right? Just like anything, I'm going to get to a place where I can only take so many breaths per minute and I can only take so much movement before I've reached a, my limit of maximal breaths and maximal tidal volume, okay? So if I'm still having problems breathing, then I got to go to my next thing. How do I get more oxygen in? Well, if I can't change the number of breaths, I've maxed that out and changed the amount of air, I've maxed that out, then I got to look at, well, let's change the air. And if I can change the air and make it more oxygen rich than what it normally is, now I can get more oxygen to the tissues. Okay. And so when you're when you're a nurse and you have patients that, again, they might be conscious, not be conscious, they're on the pulse ox and they're on the EKG. So you know what their heart's doing. The pulse ox is going to tell you what their oxygen levels are for the blood circulating through their system. Um, you're going to have maybe them on a ventilator, and the ventilator is going to be set at a certain rate and a certain amount of volume. And when the pulse ox is not happy, you have a choice to try to bring the rate of breaths up, maybe turn it from 12 breaths to 15 breaths. You have a choice to say, oh, we're only set at 450 milliliters of tidal volume. Let's bring it out to 500. All right. Uh, but there's going to be a point where I can't make the rates go any higher of breaths per minute and I can't make the volume go any bigger without potentially damaging and blowing the lungs and shredding them. Uh, so then I got to look at, well, let's put them on oxygen and let's make the air that we provide more oxygen rich, right? And we're going to get to why and how the air can be manipulated and we can get more oxygen into the system versus our atmosphere uh, as we talk about Dalton's law, all right? So. Dalton's law is next, all right? Dalton's law and Boyle's law are probably the two biggies. So if I had to basically pick the most important, I couldn't. I would have to say it's a tie. Boyle's law is big on ventilation, being able to breathe. That's what rules whether or not you get air in and uh, across your mouth and into the lungs. But Dalton's law is going to be for the air you're breathing, is there oxygen in it that's sufficient to get oxygen into your blood to 98% saturation and 2% dissolved gas? So you're carrying as much oxygen as you can to your tissues. All right. So if I was to be right now, the atmosphere in my house turned to the air became, you know, mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. It doesn't matter if Boyle's law is working. Because if Boyle's lurking and Dalton's isn't, I'm not going to get oxygen into my tissues. Flip it. If the air around me is 100% oxygen, but I have no compliance, no ability to get my lungs to, you know, inhale and exhale, uh, Dalton's law can be working. And if Boyle's law isn't, I'm not breathing. So I need those two laws to work and work in different ways to get oxygen to my cardiovascular system. Okay. So Dalton's law is that the total pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, all right, that pressure is made up of units. There's a partial pressure for nitrogen, there's a partial pressure for oxygen, and there's a partial pressure for all the other gases. And together, all those other gases add up to making a total, which is 760, okay? Now, our Earth's atmospheric combination of what is most of these visible molecules in this air around me is that 78% of the molecules around me are nitrogen gases. 21% of the gases circulating around me invisibly are going to oxygen, and about 1% of the gases around me are all the other gases, so carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane gas, argon, helium, freon, all of those gases, okay? So, again, if I was to take a chunk of this atmosphere and I was trying to turn to colored beads, again, if I had 100 molecules from the atmosphere, all right, 78% of them would be nitrogen, so 78 would be maybe colored red. 
21 would be colored blue for oxygen and 7.6 of them or I'm sorry uh, one sorry one of them would be other and other could be water could be oxygen I mean could be carbon dioxide carbon monoxide methane argon helium freon and whatever other gas that is out there okay now if you understand that, that if there's 100 molecules, that's my total, 78 is nitrogen, 21 is oxygen, and 1% is up, all right? Let's make the total now 760 balls, okay? So if I have 760 balls, which is what my atmospheric pressure is per mercury coming up to a height of 760 millimeters, how much of that 760 millimeters in height is because of the nitrogen gas. Well, if I go 0 0.78 times 760, I should get the, the amount of influence that nitrogen gas is having on my 760 total pressure. And I don't think I have it listed here, but it's something like 560 something. Again, I did math, but if you think of my analogy of if I have 760 beads, how many of them are nitrogen influenced? About 500 and something of them are due to the nitrogen gas, All right? How much of the 760 millimeter height is due to the oxygen? That's about 160 of my, my beads. And then how much of, again, the 760 height is because of other gases? That would be seven to eight of them. Okay, so Dalton's law is going to give me an idea of what are the total pressure, what are the components of it. And we are going to hone in on the components that are oxygen and the components that are carbon dioxide for the most part. Okay, because those are the two gases we're trying to get in and trying to get out. Okay, now if I was to make my environment 100% oxygen, okay. So if I was to start breathing on a mask and I was only getting in the mask oxygen gas, and it will never be 100%, it's usually like 98% oxygen, okay? Uh, 760 would now be 98% oxygen, so I don't know exactly what 90.98 times 760 is, but let's just say 758 of those 760 beads are now oxygen beads, and two are other, which could be nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, helium, argon, freon, and whatever else. Okay, so Dalton's law is part of how we can manipulate, especially for shents that need more oxygen, we can manipulate the gas they're breathing. And we can make the gas that they inhale more oxygen rich, all right? So therefore, if there is less surface area, ventilation and perfusion interactions happening, for the areas that air and gas exchange is happening, we can make those areas super, super, super oxygen rich so we can try to put more oxygen into the plasma to then be carried to the tissues, okay? This is how hyperbaric medicine works, all right? If I was to go into a hyperbaric chamber right now, okay, I am going to go down to 33 feet of water. So instead of thinking of mattresses, think about a, a um, seawater container, 33 feet of it. Every 33 feet, the pressure of 33 feet of seawater pushing on mercury is going to make mercury rise to 760 millimeters of height. So every 33 feet of seawater is one atmosphere. So if I go from sea level to 33 feet, I am now at two atmospheres. So my total pressure is now double 760, so that's like 1520, right? So my partial pressure of oxygen is now, instead of 160 at one atmosphere, it's now 320, okay? If I go to 66 feet, all right, I, total pressure, what's 1520 plus 760, that's like 22 something. My oxygen partial pressure will go, again, 160, 160, 160. So for doing public math, whatever 160 times 3 is, okay? When I'm sitting at 66 feet of seawater, breathing the air, 
all right? Now, because of that higher partial pressure of oxygen, I'm going to get more oxygen into my lungs. I am going to get more oxygen molecules moving into my plasma and into my bloodstream and getting more oxygen into my tissues. And that's why oxygen under that higher pressure we find has a healing effect, has an ability to help, again, heal non-healing diabetic ulcers, heal uh, radiation damage from cancer treatments, help us heal uh, skin grafts that are beginning to not, the tissues beginning to die. Um, we don't understand exactly how more oxygen with a little bit more pressure helps, but we know it does help. So now that's why you see more hyperbaric chambers and facilities uh, treating non-healing diabetic cancer treatment patients and maybe helping with burns, helping with skin grafts, helping patients that um, are getting some, you know, treatment that way. All right. We do know this, and, and you might be in video, um, if we keep going deeper and deeper, if we go down to like, uh, I think it's 160 feet of seawater pressure, or 180 feet, like super, super deep diving, and again, you're in a chamber, so you're simulating, you're pushing all this air in, oxygen under extreme pressure that way will make people go crazy, and it's called oxygen toxicity. And the Navy did a bunch of studies on this, because you know, Navy, the submarines go pretty deep, um, and there is something to too much oxygen under pressure. And again, when they're doing 100% oxygen uh, on a mask at these super, super deep dives, and the people started getting kind of like hypoxic, like not in their right mind. Uh, and so that's called oxygen toxicity. And I'm sure you might be able to find something on the internet if you search oxygen toxicity, Navy studies, and or... Duke University does a bunch of hyperbaric medicine studies, so it might be even through Duke University oxygen toxicity. All right. Um, so I, I know we're kind of getting to the end of our hour. So right now, I hope you understand a little bit about Dalton's law, and I hope you understand fully Boyle's law. Okay. Dalton's law is going to apply in a few different places. We've hit on why we might put someone on supplemental oxygen. All right, and how we can change the air and the, the pressure of if I am breathing a tidal volume of 500 millimeters of atmospheric air, there's only about 21% of that air oxygen. That's its partial pressure. And again, if that's total pressure is 760, and I was to try to say how many of molecules are actually oxygen, it would be, again, 21% of those molecules are oxygen. So Using my diagram of 760 particles, 160 of them are oxygen when we breathe. If I want to make all 760 or 758 of them oxygen, I would want to be on supplemental oxygen. Okay? And I can do that. All right? The other place we'll talk about, and we'll pick up here on Monday about Dalton's Law, is the air that's moving across my mouth. Remember, not all of it's going to get into my lungs. So as air goes into my mouth, my nose, my trachea, into my bronchi, and gets to my alveoli, we are going to manipulate Dalton's Law and add carbon dioxide from the dead air space that's left in there from the previous breath, and we're going to add humidity. And so we're going to have to rearrange Dalton's Law a little bit and make Dalton's law equals the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of oxygen plus the partial pressure of carbon dioxide plus the partial pressure of water plus the car partial pressure of other. We're going to have to take out of other and give it its own category, carbon dioxide and water. Okay? And because we do that, and we 760 is the same, but we're adding bigger components for water and carbon dioxide, nitrogen and oxygen are naturally going to have to decrease in the number of particles that are contributed to them. And that's a little bit of what this is showing you, is that when you inhale air, the water vapor and the carbon dioxide are part of other, that 1%. And so their partial pressure component is pretty much zero to nothing, you know. But when you start to bring the air into the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, the trachea, and you humidify it, water becomes an entity in my equation. And then as we get into that mixing with dead air space, carbon dioxide becomes an entity. And so my equation gets four big components plus other 
that now are going to each have a piece of the pie of that 760 millimeters. Okay. And I need you to understand a little bit of why that happens. And then the implication is here at sea level, happy sitting here smiling at you, I am breathing air that starts off with 160 molecules of oxygen right here around me. As I breathe in that air and I add carbon dioxide and humidity to that air from the dead air space, I am going to get into my alveoli air that the partial pressure of oxygen and the best I can do without breathing supplemental oxygen is that oxygen in my lungs has a partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. That means if I have one air sac and there's 760 molecules of air in there, only 100 are going to be oxygen. And it's those 100 molecules, that partial pressure of 100, that is pushing oxygen into my blood so I get 98% hemoglobin saturation and a certain amount of oxygen, the 2%, that's going to go into the plasma as a dissolved gas. And that's perfect. And that works and that is what humans need. Okay? And any time the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is not 100, then I'm going to start to worry about, well, am I getting enough oxygen into my red blood cells to bind to hemoglobin and to keep my plasma? Okay? And that's what this table down here is trying to show you, is as we go up in altitude and we continue to breathe air, the partial pressure of oxygen outside is going to drop. The partial pressure of oxygen is going to then have to drop in the lungs as total pressure drops. And because carbon dioxide and humidity do not change that much, the oxygen is going to drop pretty rapidly. And I might not then have the ability when the partial pressure of oxygen at 10,000 feet is only uh, 60 millimeters of mercury in my alveoli, I might not have the ability to make my hemoglobin fully loaded and saturated. And so that might be why at 10,000 feet I start to be a little crazy, I start to be a little kooky, I start to be a little hypoxic. Okay? Um, when you're talking about the same mask, are you talking like, so, our U-2 pilots, they wear the mask, and their flights might be 12 to 16 hours. And the big thing then is that their oxygen container has to be able to provide supplemental oxygen and pressure for 16 hours of flight. Uh, some of our, again, airlines, you know, if you fly from Houston, I think, to 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 Japan, that could be like a 10 to 12 hour flight. And if it was something that you had to be on oxygen because the, the pressurization system doesn't work and you're going to be at a high altitude for the time and the distance, uh, yeah, some of these masks of supplemental oxygen, yeah, you can be on them. Think about your hospital patient. Uh, that mask is on them for the entire time they're asleep, the entire time they're on the ventilator and you just change out the oxygen canisters they're connected to. So the mask can be worn, yeah, for as long as it's needed, you just have to make sure your supply of air, your supply of oxygen, your supply of pressurized gas continuously can be provided. So it's not like a cloth mask where eventually you're gonna wet it and chew on it like my kids do and have to change it out, okay? And again, most of those masks are made of more rubber, more impenetrable plastic, okay? So, all right, let's call it a day. I'm going to stop the recording. This is a long one.